this happened recently where the Arab League has voted to readmit Syria after uh, it was expelled in the early years of the Syria Dirty War. And uh, this is a pretty significant development because it shows especially that Saudi Arabia is you know, breaking away somewhat from, you know, the U.S. led order and is following its own policies and reestablishing ties with the country that it tried to overthrow. Because Saudi Arabia was heavily involved in the dirty war, uh, arming sectarian death squads and even, according to one NSA leak, directing them. There was that famous directive to light up Damascus. That's what a a top Saudi official said to rebels in, in Syria, light up Damascus with rockets, attack the Damascus airport. So this, you know, was done pretty much at the behest of Saudi Arabia, you know, leading the way and allowing Syria to come back. And, you know, it's a sign of, you know, growing slow recovery from this horrible war. But yet there's one party that remains steadfastly opposed to it, and that's the U.S. And the fact that the U.S. is so bitterly opposed to Syria being readmitted to the Arab League, and of course the U.S. is not an Arab state, it has nothing to do with the Arab League, it, it underscores to me who the real player was behind the Syria dirty war. It was the U S because while everyone else is now try, you know, trying to move on and make peace, uh, the U S is still bitterly opposed. And to, you know, underscore that a group of bipartisan lawmakers have just introduced a measure that would intensify the already brutal sanctions imposed on Syria under the Caesar act. And also, you know, threaten sanctions against other countries that engage with Syria any further to the point where there's a provision that would sanction any country that allows a Syrian airliner to land at its airports. So basically, if a Syrian civilian aircraft lands at your airport, you could face U.S. sanctions. So what these lawmakers are calling for is exactly what Trump tried to do in the U.S., which is a Muslim ban. But they want a Syrian ban, and not just a Syrian ban in the U.S., but a Syrian ban worldwide. They don't want Syrians to be able to travel to foreign countries. That, that's how sadistic people in Washington are. And uh, to me, their animus toward this, you know, basic step of readmitting Syria to the Arab League, because Syria is an Arab state, it, it underscores that they were, of course, the driving factor behind this dirty war all along. Yeah. Do you, I think we should hear from uh, Joel Rayburn, who helped destroy Syria and just while at the Trump, while in the Trump administration, and is stating the elucidating the point of the Caesar sanctions, which is to lower the bar to prevent Syria from being re re reconstructed to destroy its civilian population, and shows how sweeping it is that you can be sanctioned without even any tie to the Syrian government. To, uh... Uh, prove legal sufficiency under certain sanctions authorities. Um, the Caesar Act really lowers the bar for us. Uh, we don't have to prove, for example, that a company that's going in to do a reconstruction project in the Damascus region um, is dealing directly with uh, the Assad regime. We don't have to have the evidence to prove that link. We just have to have the evidence that proves that a company or an individual is investing in that sector in the construction sector, the engineering sector, um, most of the aviation sector, finance sector, uh, energy sector, and, and so on. Yeah. So, and, and, you know, while Syrians are starving, 90% living below the poverty line, according to a UN report last year, as a direct result of U.S. sanctions, Joel Rayburn's eaten good in the neighborhood. What a disgusting character. And here's him celebrating his achievement. So there he is. So we just heard him bragging about how uh, the Caesar Act lowers the bar to sanction Syria. And he's talking about destroying every single sector of the economy, right? So when you destroy the economy, predictably the, the people are going to suffer, which Rayburn celebrated. This is him just shortly before last Christmas. He says, Assad's economy and state are collapsing. And when he says Assad, he means an entire country because Syria is not just populated by one guy named Assad. It's populated by millions of people, most of whom live below the poverty line. So he says, no fuel, no electricity, no commerce. Streets are empty. Assad just prints money to pay salaries and bills. Result, inflation making basic needs unaffordable. So he's bragging that his sanctions have made basic needs unaffordable. And he goes on 
The Syrian government, with no fuel and power, shuts down offices, schools, services to cut costs. Hooray! <laughs> um, people are desperate. Many trying to leave regime areas, even crossing seas. Yes. Thanks to you, Joel Rayburn, people are so desperate that they're crossing seas. And by that, he means they're going on these little rafts to try to cross over to, you know, uh, Lebanon or Turkey or elsewhere. And people like Alan Kurdi then die in the process. Alan Kurdi, that young Syrian uh, boy who washed up on a shore in Greece, I think it was. It was you know, his, his, Turkey, I believe. The Turkey, yeah. You know, so, I mean, it's just... And, and you see him there, he's doing this, he's celebrating all this as if this is an achievement of his. And it shows how easy it is now to destroy countries. Joel Rayburn doesn't need to you know, work for a government that's sending off troops to Syria, although U.S. troops are in Syria stealing its oil. But that's not how the main damage is being done, although it is significant. The main damage is being done through the sanctions that he helped impose from his air-conditioned office. And that leads to massive deprivation, just like that. So you don't have to send bombs or weapons, or, or at least not just bombs and weapons. Now you can also destroy people's lives with the stroke of a pen. Yep. Like a little Eichmann. Yep. Uh, we're going to be, I've been working with a young Syrian American journalist named Hekmat Abu Khater, and he has just been in Syria. He was visiting family and homes and traveled across several governments and returned with a piece for us. I'll be publishing probably tonight, definitely by tomorrow about how sanctions are affecting average civilians. But as part of uh, Hekmat's work, he um, had Syrian students submit how uh, videos on how sanctions are affecting their lives. Here's a video by a 19-year-old Syrian student inside Syria who's trying to be part of the global digital world and what happens to him from the point of view of his laptop screen. So Peter Jabor's day begins at 4.30 a.m. Uh, because that's when he gets two hours of electricity. Wants to learn programming, so let's see the sites he can learn from. He goes to Google. Coursera. Nope. If you go to Coursera from Syria, it says OFAC restrictions Treasury Department restrictions from the U.S. prevent you from using that site. Access denied again. The Code Academy. His old iPhone is, is, is out of date. Let's buy a new iPhone. Buy iPhone mini. The Apple Store doesn't even exist in Syria. He tries to buy it inside Syria, an iPhone 13. It costs 20, close to $2,500 to get a, one on the black market. Let's see if he can uh, upload his uh, video that he made to TikTok. It doesn't work in Syria because of Caesar sanctions. Snapchat doesn't work either. Forbidden. The daily things that you do and think are simply are simple are impossible things in Syria because of the sanctions. That's from 19 year old Peter Jabor. Um, and all of these young Syrians are blocked from fulfilling their dreams simply because they are Syrians living in territory controlled by their government. Thanks to little Eichmann's like Joel Rayburn. So it is a positive development that Syria is normalizing relations with its neighbors. Uh, this will mean a more peaceful region, and hopefully it will mean, um, you know, with Syria rejoining the Arab League, that there can be some diplomatic and trade openings so that Syria's economy can improve because it means that the lives of millions of people will improve from the deliberate immiseration and destruction imposed on them by the collective West. And one factor I see here and why this diplomatic breakthrough is taking place is Iran. Um, uh, Ibrahim Raisi, the Iranian president, visited uh, uh, Syria five days before uh, Syria was allowed to uh, reapply and participate again in the Syrian Arab League. Uh, Iran has been pushing for Syrian normalization. Syria is a traditional ally of 
Iran going back to the days of Hafez al-Assad. And Iran and Saudi Arabia are engaged in a diplomatic breakthrough brought on by China. One reason I think this that diplomatic breakthrough, which leads to the breakthrough for Syria, took place uh, goes back to 2020, the assassination of Qasem Soleimani, the Iranian major general, second most important official in Iran, who was killed on his way to a peace conference in Baghdad to broker Sunni Shia peace and peace with Saudi Arabia. Iran responded with a very advanced ballistic missile attack on the Al-Assad air base the, in Iraq, the largest U.S. base. It did a lot of damage to that base, destroyed much of it. Uh, many soldiers uh, suffered traumatic head injuries and were transferred to the Ramstein Air Base in Germany. And Saudi Arabia was watching that take place. Saudi Arabia, which had also been um, experiencing ballistic missile attacks from Ansar Allah, the so-called Houthis, uh, or the Houthis actually managed to attack Aramco oil fields with uh, missiles and drones. And Saudi Arabia saw the sophistication of Iran's military technology and what it was able to do to the U.S. And they said, you know what, maybe it would be better for us if we actually dealt with them instead of continuing to join the U.S. and Israel in moving towards a regional war that we may not survive. Our entire oil industry could be destroyed. And so here we are. Um, and Syria is, is, welcoming, is being welcomed back in as well. And Syria is also a top trade partner of US allies like Jordan. Uh, it's a top trade partner of Lebanon whose economy is being destroyed through sanctions as well. Uh, and what Hekmat, our reporter in Syria, young Syrian American journalist told me is that Syrians for the first time are beginning to experience some degree of hope that maybe there's a light at the end of the tunnel. And, and these are the people who, uh, when whenever whenever the U.S. media talks about going after the regime, U.S. officials talk about going after the regime, this is who they're talking about. Uh, there's even one uh, former Trump official named Andrew Tabler, who was a top U.S. official for Syria, oh, yeah. where he said that, um, he says that uh, U.S. sanctions on Syria have helped plunge Syria's dollar, which he says has led to corresponding cuts to regime subsidies which has, I'm quoting him, exacerbated food and fuel shortages for everyday Americans. Uh, sorry, for everyday Syrians. For yeah. everyday Syrians. So he's bragging that U.S. sanctions have led to food and fuel shortages for our everyday Syrians. And so not only is he laying bare the sadism of uh, U.S. policy, but also he's undermining the propaganda used to justify it. Because, you know, whenever... They say sanctions, it's, they say it's done against the regime. Well, here he's admitting that these sanctions have forced the regime to cut subsidies. Re, he says regime subsidies to or, ordinary Syrians. Yeah. So he's, he's laying bare who the real targets are. It's ordinary people. Yep. Uh, the Syrian government is providing uh, Syrian public workers with something like a $16 a month subsidy so they can buy wheat and uh, basic goods, uh, which is obviously not enough. Taxi drivers have to sometimes pass each other plastic bottles uh, full of gasoline just so they can get their uh, passengers home. And Syrians are showing up in the marketplace um, at stores with giant plastic bags or fanny packs filled with uh, the Syrian lira, Syrian dollars, uh, because you have to like literally bring hundreds of them just to equal like five or ten dollars worth of currency. Um, and that is due to U.S. sanctions causing hyperinflation by design. So this is the rules based order. This is the rules based order in a nutshell that Tony Blinken and the U.S. State Department talk about. They make the rules and, and you follow their orders. And if you don't follow their orders, like Syria, which has traditionally been an independent country, that a non-aligned country, um, you will be crushed by a big fat Eichmann like Joel Rayburn. Anyway, look, look out for our report from Hekmat Abu Khater um, at the Gray Zone. Uh, it'll really show you what life is like inside Syria and we'll be featuring more of those kinds of reports in the future.